thank you for joining us. Thank you for sacrificing an hour of um, your new freedom and your sun sun filled freedom to um, to meet with us. Uh, we've got a, a full agenda uh, for this morning. So the only thing that I wanted to say before we get going is just to draw your attention again to um, the school board um, um, site on, I think, SharePoint, uh, where we have now three uh, forms for you to kind of participate in advance to sort of help to shape the, um, the, the, the meeting, the agenda. Uh, the first one again is the um, is if you want to raise an item or suggest an item uh, for discussion as an agenda item, uh, there is a form that you fill in and that you um, um, send to Jenny. Uh, there's also a um, a form to submit an advance written question if you'd like that question to be um, asked at the appropriate time uh, by me over the course of the meeting, uh, then you can um, fill that in and again, send it to Jenny. And we have one of those uh, today. And then the third one, which is new, um, is a proposal, a, a form to propose um, a speaker, um, somebody that you would like to hear from uh, at a subsequent, um, at a future board meeting. So those are three forms, uh, which are designed to um, encourage board members to participate in sort of shaping the discussion and the agenda of, um, of future meetings. So I very much hope that you um, will take advantage of those um, in the months to come. So without, I mean, that's, that's really all I have to um, say um, at, at the start, uh, sort of before we get uh, to the substance of the meeting, uh, David, you like to, uh, uh, do the policy and procedures on contracts and employment, please. Yeah, uh, morning. Um, as we do with every school board meeting, um, I need to read out this policy and procedure on contracts of employment, and this covers the range of the 31st of March to the 31st of August um, 2021. The information below is provided to the school board in line with the university policy and procedure on contracts of employment in order that it may provide feedback if it wishes to the university staffing committee, which meets around four times a year, to consider proposals for dismissal of staff on fixed term or finite funded contracts due to redundancy. In line with the policy, collective consultation takes place regularly with trade unions and at local level, individual consultations take place. The consultations include seeking ways to avoid dismissal and reducing the numbers of employees to be dismissed. In this school for the period of March to the 31st of August 2021, there are currently 73 members of staff on either fixed term or permanent contracts whose funding is of finite duration and who are therefore at risk of redundancy at the conclusion of their contract of employment. As indicated above through collective consultation and individual consultation between the members of the staff and their line managers, Efforts are being made to seek further funding or redeployment opportunities in order to avert the consequences of redundancy. It should be noted that most of the staff who are at risk of redundancy and who wish to continue working at the university are successfully retained in employment. If the school board wishes to make any comments, these should be submitted by the chair to the head of human resources in the first instance. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. Okay, uh, Tony. Thank you. Update, Thank you, Ian, and uh, good morning to everybody. Um, I, I'm only going to make a few comments, but obviously I'm happy to take any questions from any member of the school about any issue. If I can't answer it today, I will write it down and come back to you. So uh, please feel free to ask anything uh, that is of concern to you. I'm there. I'm conscious of the um, program and the fact that we'll hear from Gabrielle and Andy on matters relevant to teaching and research, I'm sure. So I thought I would just make um, four bullet points. The first on the pandemic itself. Manchester's um, COVID cases are running at around 95 per 100,000, which is twice the national average. 
So although the R number is below one, we still have a higher than average number of patients with coronavirus infections. But the most important thing to point out is that um, the number of admissions to hospital with severe infections is declining rapidly, as is the death rate. And indeed, when I was on call on the COVID wards the weekend before last, I am delighted to report that I saw no new cases admitted as emergencies over Saturday and the Sunday. So uh, I, I sincerely hope that we are at the beginning of the end of this um, particular wave. I can't speak for later in the autumn, but hopefully the vaccination booster program will minimize the admission rates again in uh, the autumn months. So on to school matters. Um, the last couple of months have been preoccupied at faculty and university level by uh, matters uh, financial and setting uh, budgets. Uh, we have an outstanding uh, Director of Finance in Charlotte Green, and um, I'm delighted to report that we have submitted a budget which has been accepted as balanced, uh, and uh, at the moment uh, we appear to be riding out the financial storm uh, as a school, uh, and um, I don't think we have any major concerns at this moment. Um, in terms of research, uh, Andy will obviously speak to this, uh, we were expected to be buffeted by the um, reduction in charity funding and that may still be an issue but within next week the charity shops on the high street will reopen uh, and the major charities at least seem to be again weathering that particular financial storm a bit better than perhaps was anticipated. The same can't be said for UKRI and maybe Andy will want to address that uh, in his um, comments. Uh, with regard to teaching, um, I thought I would just um, talk about the major programs in general. Um, I know that the various leaders are uh, on the board, at the board meeting, so they, they can come back to me if, um, uh, or, 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 or clarify issues of detail. The number of applications uh, to read on the MBCHB program has again risen, um, and um, we still have 36 students who were deferred uh, from last year who want to take up their place in September and um, a further 30 odd students who resat their A-levels in the autumn and have also been given places. We anticipate that these will be outside the R cap of 397 and therefore ultimately the year will be uh, a larger one as this year was at around 495 students. Um, However, I think that is um, something which, with which we can deal, given the fact we planned for that sort of number last year, uh, although appreciably less came in. With regard to dentistry, um, similar uh, increase in numbers, uh, a few held over from last year in deferred places, uh, but perhaps not as congested as last year. Although the other problems that we have uh, with aerosol generating procedures uh, the number of um, students, final year students who will graduate this year may be compromised by the lack of um, skills which we've not been able to teach them because uh, of the restricted places in the hospital. The physician associate program is also very popular, but uh, we'll, we'll be taking in around 65. Our applications both from overseas and uh, from domestic students to um, read our postgraduate courses has also gone up with um, gratifyingly increased numbers from India as well as uh, increased numbers from China. So although there were um, messages of doom and gloom around the fact that overseas um, applications might go down and although we still have to wait and see whether these people can actually get to read their programs uh, face to face in, in Manchester at any time in the future, uh, it does look as if um, Manchester remains as popular as ever. The final point that I make is, um, as some of you will be aware, intimately involved in the early years of the MBCHP programme, it is undergoing an external review by John McLaughlin. Um, I have spoken with him. The idea is not one of 
looking at reducing the numbers of staff that are delivering. Then the idea is to look at an opportunity perhaps to, to move um, the first two years forward because it hasn't been reviewed for some considerable time. I know that many members of the Division of Medical Education were somewhat alarmed by comments made uh, when the president visited uh, SMS uh, last month, but in actual fact, uh, those were her personal views and not necessarily those uh, held by people within SMS at this moment. Uh, and uh, I think her comments were also relevant in terms of testing whether in fact we do need to look at the way that we deliver the course, uh, but everything's on the table uh, and we'll see what John comes up with. I'm going to stop there. I've probably only spoken for five or six minutes, so I'm happy to take any questions that there are at this moment, Ian, or we can move straight on and people can ask me later on or in the chat. Okay. Um, so I should have said at the beginning that obviously you can raise your hand uh, during to ask a question or you can put your question on um, the chat and then Jenny can draw that to my attention. Um, I probably, Doug is uh, on, um, on holiday this week. Uh, so if there aren't any, um, I'm being told that my internet um, is unstable, which I hope is not, is not reflective of my, uh, my own uh, sort of uh, state. But if you can hear me, then maybe what we can do, oh, okay. I can see a question from Andrew. Andrew, would you like to unmute? Yes, Thank you. hi, um, hang on. I'll just switch my video on. Um, hello, Andrew. Hello, welcome everybody. Um, lovely summary, Tony, as always, and, and um, good, good news too, to see how well things are going. Um, but it's a general comment. Um, when, this, when the current faculty was created, um, we merged the biologists with the um, medical school, um, literally half in, half in each of the two primary schools. And um, it, it, sadly, um, we don't seem to have an opportunity in this forum ever to discuss or mention anything to do with the teaching activities that consumes 50% um, of the school. And I, unfortunately, I think a number of people just don't take part in these meetings because they don't see that it's a particular relevance to them, um, which I think is very sad. Um, so I wonder whether, I, we can't do it now, but whether longer term, you could think about some internal restructuring so that we can have some information um, on the primary bioscience programs on which many of us teach. And in the division that I'm in, the majority of the teaching activity is in fact devoted um, to the primary bioscience degrees. Um, it's very difficult to get information on those degrees and we're not taking part in the School of Biological Sciences um, uh, or what the, um, meet, meetings. Um, so um, we, one can sometimes feel a little bit isolated. Um, I can probably a more tactful way of putting that, but um, would you be able to give some thought to that um, with your colleagues and see whether there's some way we can um, at, at least partway address the interests of the people who are, in, who are teaching on the basic science degrees? Um, Andrew, I can, I can certainly pledge to provide data. Um, the actual content of this particular meeting is in the gift of Ian and colleagues. I have no say in what, what's actually delivered here. If they put it on the agenda, I can provide it here. Otherwise, I can communicate with you uh, directly. My, I mean, <laughs> I'm certainly happy. No, go on, go on, Andrew. I think it should be general, not to me personally. I think it should be to the entire school. Okay, well, so, I mean, I'm very happy to have this, um, forum be used as part of that but I but my understanding was that An Andrew was talking about were you talking about setting up a sort of a, an alternative structure or actually using this board 
for um, having a regular um, sort of uh, sort of agenda item that would discuss matters of uh, of, of teaching across the two schools. I, I think that would help. We don't need to make it a great prolonged issue. And I uh, see Simon Luckman has suggested it should be a standing item. Um, that might solve the problem. Um, just a, a, a simple um, spreadsheet of the status quo, what's happening um, would be helpful. Okay, well, so let's, let, let us take that um, under advisement for the next thing. Richard has his hand up. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to second what Andrew has, has just said. Um, about 90% of my teaching is in SBS. And I, I can't find out what's going on at their board. We don't get invited to it. We don't get any summaries of what's gone on there. And one of the reasons I've come along today is that I watched the video of the SBS board last week and I was under the impression that Steve Pettifer was going to be presenting here like he did at the SBS board. And there were some major issues uh, regarding SBS teaching, which I was hoping to have the opportunity to, to put to him today. Um, it's, it's hard not to feel undervalued if you're an SBS teacher within medical sciences. I mean, have you, have you, Richard, have you asked to be admitted to, you know, the, the, the board uh, meetings? We, we've made many requests to be provided with information about, about what's going in, on in SBS, but it tends to be an issue with administrators rather than academic staff. So in theory, we're supposed to be told and invited to SBS events, but it actually never happens. It was a bit, it, I mean, Carolyn is, is, is the chair of the board, right? I would imagine she'd be sympathetic to that. Um, um, probably, but then it's, John, I, I think, you, you, you know, we, we okay. were, a lot of us who were teaching focus were put into medical sciences because medical education was the only dedicated teaching division in the, in the, uh, Mm. faculty but really a lot of people in well a small group let's put it that way of people in that division um are primarily biomedical teachers rather than medical teachers right okay all right um well i think that we have a meeting of the of the um of the chairs of the various um, school boards coming up in the next, it, this week. I mean, I'll certainly talk to Carolyn about that, but Tony, um, maybe we can have a um, discussion. Absolutely, offline. but I, I, uh, I, <laughs> I, I want Richard to know that he's just as valued as anybody else in SMS. So whatever you need, Richard, we'll find it for you. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so, can we now move to the next item, which is, is uh, to hear from uh, Gabrielle Finn, Vice uh, Dean for Teaching, uh, Learning and Students. Gabrielle, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Ian. I'm just gonna try and get my slide share to work, hopefully. Is that, sorry, I can't see what you can see. Is that visible? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, great. So I just want to, is that on full screen? Sorry, it's not showing on mine. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Great. Yeah. So I just wanted to start by thanking everybody because you know since I started in September, it's been a somewhat of a baptism by fire. Um, the pandemic has been relentless, and I know that everybody is working beyond their contracted hours. Um, and I wanted to express my personal thanks um, as the vice dean for teaching for the excellent education that people have been providing to our students. It's been phenomenal. And I know that the students and all of FLT really do appreciate people's efforts. We are still in somewhat of a reactionary phase, as many of you know, um, with respect to the pandemic. Um, obviously the 8th of March saw somewhat of a phased return. Um, we, we have the majority of students have in S in BMH, it's quite different to the other faculties with regards to the, the amount of practical teaching. Um, so we've been exempt from lots of the most strict um, conditions in the DFE guidelines. 
Um, all we're doing with students is really trying to advise them to keep up with the routine testing, to adhere to PP and social distancing requirements. And those who've been in the meetings with the students and Nancy and April will know that the students actually are very concerned about their peers not adhering to that. So I think we're in a pretty good state that there will be sort of self-regulation um, with regards to these sort of rules with the students. Um, so hopefully we'll maintain a good safe campus as best we possibly can. The 12th of April is the date that we're working to for more students to be able to return. We are expecting an announcement on the 5th from the government, so it doesn't give us a lot, a lot of time. Um, but I know that the hot listers and programme directors have been working with myself and Helen Eccles um, to try and make sure that we're as prepared for whatever that announcement um, may be. And we'll be in touch in due course, um, obviously, trying to respect that people will be taking some leave as they rightly should at that time. We've approved all of the semester two assessments that all of the programmes have requested and they've gone through um, the Central University TLG. We're still looking at all of the different issues that we've faced with remote proctoring, with um, regulators and their requirements. And that's just a sort of evolving situation that we're monitoring as carefully as possible. The big ticket items that programme directors and heads of teaching and learning are working on us with at the moment is this audit of programmes so that we can try and get an understanding of what we can offer students for semester one. So will a programme be entirely on campus with social distancing and such, which we're working to at the moment? Will it be blended? Or if a student is either doesn't feel safe to return to campus or as the situation is for many of our students are in countries where they're still on red lists or they can't travel, will remote study be an option for them for semester one? We have been asked to then speak to programmes to see if a student took up a remote option for semester one and was unable to return for semester two, would they have to defer? Um, so we need to look into that and whether students may prefer to take a year of deferral. Um, obviously, that would impact upon student numbers and such. Um, hopefully, we won't get to that situation. In terms of some of our other activity, many of you will be aware that the Office for Students is conducting a compliance review at the moment. We've got a deadline of the 14th of April to return all of that. Um, it's not in a substantial form, it's pretty colossal. Um, what we are doing is working the vice deans and the hotlisters have met together, oh, sorry, the heads, um, PS heads of ed, teaching and learning, we've met and we've tried to collect some sort of generic as best we can responses that programmes will be able to use and just edit if there is something that is different. It's trying to get the balance. Obviously, it's very important. We have to do it, but it's also housed internally and we may get audited. So we need to just make sure that the workload is reflective of where we are at the moment. Tony has mentioned the MB um, review, which is underway at the moment. I thought it was really important that we had somebody external and entirely objective conducting that review. Um, you'll have seen from the communications that we did choose Professor John McLaughlin, who is the head of school at UCLan, but more importantly is part of the GMC and works on the MLA. Um, we need to make sure that the early years of the curriculum are fit for the medical licensing assessment and that they support the revised years three, four and five. Um, there are no foregone conclusions. This is not a review of PBL. This is not a review of contracts. This is to look at whether the curriculum is fit for purpose for modern contemporary medical education. And I think John is in an absolutely brilliant position to be able to conduct that review. And I just wanted to thank everyone who's been involved in trying to bring that to fruition at a difficult time because there's a lot of work that's gone on behind the scenes um, in terms of compiling lists and documents and trying to coordinate um, a plethora of diaries. I do want to make sure that we're not permanently in a reactionary state with teaching and learning. So as you can see, we've had quite a lot of new um, task and finish groups. The racial discrimination group um, is colossal actually, which is a real testament to the desire within the faculty to change the culture. Um, both within the faculty and within the NHS, because obviously we, we have students who have reported issues there. They're looking at things like inclusive curricula, anti-racism training, um, and it's been, I think that's going really well. 
Um, we're looking at a new group that Minnie Singh has kindly gone to chair with um, Matthew Shaw from SHS, who does the CPE, looking at CPD provision. So where are we now and where do we want to be? Are we maximising the CPD um, within the faculty? And there is our mental health group that we've got Carol Yates um, and now McLaughlin chairing. At the moment, we're looking at APP and our provision for bursaries and fees to see if we support widening access students as well as other faculties. We actually do seem to do slightly better, um, but we will be asked to do more so that we level the playing field um, across the institution. Carol and PG colleagues will be aware that we have a new PGT strategy group that meets monthly and we're trying to look at the strategy for program approvals, reviews, module sharing and just to try and see whether we are really adhering to the best practice in our PGT space. Another area that we've been asked to look at is that of associate lecturers um, that have also been called super GTAs or GTAs on steroids. Um, to see whether they are fit for the needs of our faculty and whether it's something that we could use more in a teaching and learning space. Um, lots of other Russell Group universities um, have them. I worked at the University of York before joining Manchester, um, where associate lecturers were used routinely and were a brilliant addition to the faculty. These are sometimes PhD students who are in a writing up phase or postdocs who think that they may want a more teaching focused um, career and they do a significant amount of teaching. Many of you attended the academic malpractice discussion forum that we had on Friday. We are aware of the colossal number of people coming through academic malpractice, particularly cohort level. Um, pharmacy, for example, had 25 cases in a day alone. We're looking at working with the Central University to see how we can deal with these issues. We need to give students the opportunity to be able to speak candidly about their own mitigation, whilst also getting the balance of seeing where we can deal with kit, you know, mass cases um, in a more streamlined fashion. So we're looking at that. There's no quick fix. We've added in declarations to the start of assessments that, you know, for students that they won't collude. We've got whistleblowing email addresses set up. We're trying all sorts um, and we just appreciate anybody's input if you can think of ways that we can try and improve our systems. But I do appreciate the tremendous amount of work that this has placed on our colleagues working in FTP. I've already mentioned the CPD, um, looking at where we are and where we want to go to. There've been a lot of requests since I started to think about how we might get medical ed and health professions education research back on the agenda. Um, I've spoken to both Graham Lord and Neil Hanley and they're very supportive of that and had a couple of early conversations with the school, you know, the education researchers in HUMS. We're hoping to see how we could raise the profile of the work that does continue. It just seems to sometimes go under the radar within that discipline. We are one of the biggest, med well, we are the biggest medical skill now with the additional numbers. So we want to look at what are our unique selling points in terms of pedagogic research. There are requests to join this group from both SMS and SBS and SHS, which is great. Um, I really want to make sure that we're not a standalone entity, that we really do link with the education offering centrally and that people who want to be ref returned can be. Obviously, that's part of a bigger picture um, conversation. Some of you who are on Athena Swan will be aware that I've recently finished a piece of research for NIHR and medical, well, multiple funders for six or seven, looking at the future clinical academic pipeline, which I thought I'd mention in this meeting because it's pertinent to lots of the people on TNR and TNS contracts. Um, it's really great to hear that Manchester are so committed to looking at the inequities that clinical academics face, particularly women and um, our black and Asian colleagues in clinical academia. Um, so I'm hopeful that we'll see some real positive change and that sort of speaks to the review of some of the teaching and contracts and whether we can start to offer GT, um, these associate lecturer positions. In terms of curricula, this is applies across the board. Um, I'm mindful of the comments from um, Andrew and Richard earlier about biomedical sciences. We are trying to work across all programs to think about inclusive curricula, to look at differential attainment because we are pretty poor on that 
trying to think about our distance and flexible learning offerings moving forwards. There is a potential pilot program for twin programs. So that is where a program would run sort of a sister program that is online only. Um, and I've been asked to offer one program in the faculty to go into that pilot potentially for 2022. Um, there's definite interest in SBS. So if there are any programs in SMS that feel that that might be something they'd be interested in, please do get in touch. And the other thing is we're trying to concentrate on our internationalization and our links to social responsibility, obviously working with Keith Brennan there. We need to grow our international numbers, but I'm also mindful of the um, additional work that we sometimes need to do around our um, IELTS and supporting our students. So it's trying to balance that to make sure that we're, we're not trying to dismiss international applications. We're not cherry picking people for our PGT programs. Um, but also mindful of the burden of work. So it's a bit of a whistle stop too of, of, through some of the um, big issues. But I guess the, the main point is thank you. And the second point is we really just need to try and not be so reactionary. And I really want to make sure that we're trying to push the teaching and learning agenda forward in a positive manner. I'll just stop that screen share. Thank you very much. Um, so there's a lot of chat going on here. Where is there? Oh, sorry, I haven't seen yeah, that. Yeah, there is a lot of chat. Um, there are some questions. Uh, I mean, one of them, which, I, um, which I'll just sort of read uh, to start with. Uh, there are many of us who would like to do pedagogical research, but are so heavily loaded with teaching that we can't. What is going to be the strategy for freeing up TS staff so they can do a little bit less T and a bit more S. Yeah, absolutely. So there is a newly formed, no, Manchester and its acronyms, I've forgotten what we've called ourselves, but there is a new group that is looking at the work, well, not to call it a workload model, um, but we're looking at teaching contributions and workload in the whole so that we're looking not just at people's teaching contributions, but their administrative and their research and scholarship and the entire picture. So I'm hopeful that that will go some way in terms of trying to balance the books for teaching and learning and make sure people do get a space to engage in scholarship as best they can. Um, and that pedagogic research group is, you know, it's research, it's scholarship, it's whatever people want it to be. Um, so if you are interested, please do let me know and I'll make sure that people are looped into those conversations. Thank you. Uh, Richard, do you have a follow up? Yeah, Gabriel, that sounds like a, a really good way forward, but it's kind of jam tomorrow. Well, mm -hmm. jam not next year. What's going to happen next year? Because many of us have picked up additional loads due to uh, voluntary severance, getting stuff online, and with no teaching contribution system this year, how are those excessive loads going to be managed as we move into the next academic year? Mm. It's a really tricky one. We're, we're working with all of the heads of school. We've got representation from each school on that group to try and manage it and be as proactive as we possibly can. You know, we're, we're, I guess it's we're all working a bit in the dark at the moment with the student numbers. Um, so all I can ask is people are patient with us and that you know you please keep open lines of communication with your line manager if people have suggestions and strategies and you know, please do get in touch. I'm hopeful that we could turn around some of these associate GTAs if they were to be approved. Um, I'm going to have, I've got a meeting actually with Judy Williams later today and I'll bring that up with Judy who's a big advocate for these roles. Hopefully that would help support academic colleagues and try and take away some of the burden. Um, I can't promise but I will certainly fight for it. Tony, I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that point. Um, I would just like to throw out the hint to Richard that um, there may be a meeting about teaching allocation this year. It really depends on when we get a steer from the university on how they want the courses delivered. In other words, how much is online and how much is face to face, because until we have a model, we can't actually begin to discuss how we deliver. Um, so um, I'm going to say watch this space, Richard. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, we've got Anne White who wants to 
come in on on this? Uh, yeah, it was just that I think it's very good that Gabrielle's here. And um, that was a really nice summary, but I hope as well that you heard the previous points from Andrew Loudon. That, yes, I've made a note. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the organisation of teaching and the organisation of staff in the schools causes this problem. And mm. so, you know, it's a matter that needs to be addressed ac across how teaching is planned mm. because we're just not hearing um, things that are happening because they're happening because they're their organization is based in a different school. Yes. So we contribute, but we don't get the feedback, which is dangerous mm -hmm. for teaching and for teaching quality. So I thought you're here and you can see what it, we're saying. And Andrew's right. A lot of people who are doing a lot of the teaching are just not coming to the school board mm. either. Are these, is this minuted, this conversation? Yeah, great. Thank you, Jenny. Yeah, so we can certainly, I think, Tony, it would probably be pertinent for us to raise this as an FLT with taking the minutes of this conversation to make sure that, you know, SBA, we get some equality across all of the schools and that colleagues in SMS who are teaching for SBS feel heard and valued. And yeah, so thank you, Anne. I'll, ma I'll make sure that we do raise that. Thank you. Yes, I, I, it, it's not, it's not a... a, a uh, an issue of our making, Anne, <laughs> but we'll try and put it right. <laughs> That's good. That would be really helpful, but it just does seem that any summaries of where we're at, we don't hear half of it. Yeah, well, I'm sorry, through Ian and, and via Gabrielle, I think this is, uh, um, it, it's an issue of, of the almost silo mentality of the three schools. And uh, um, without stealing Gabrielle's thunder whatsoever. She's already been thinking across the schools in terms of delivery. So with that in mind, plus um, taking this issue to the faculty leadership team, we'll try and level it up and, and make it more transparent for all of you. That's great, thank you. Um, so I got a, a, a question which I think um, is a follow up to what it is that you said, Tony. So this is probably to you. Um, is there any particular focus for the topics or areas that the pedagogic research group would like to consider um, and support? I'm going to bounce that to Gabrielle. <laughs> After that, Gabrielle, okay. Lots. Um, so as an education researcher, for me, it's like being in a candy shop coming to a new institution with all of this excellent work going on. Um, but I'm trying not to go, you know, run before we can walk. There's, it's, for me, the key is that we, Manchester has to have an identity within pedagogic research and scholarship. We need a brand, we need a Twitter handle, all of that stuff that matters to have a presence, because I think we are better placed than any other institution to get lots of that research money that would help us really, you know, to support um, education broadly. You know, we, we got it at HIMSS with just a medical school and then a, latterly a PA cohort. So Manchester with the interprofessional education element that there's so much potential. Um, widening access would be a good area. I know that um, Andrew Maudsley in SHS is absolutely so keen to get this off the ground running. Um, he's really keen to look at resilience. There are colleagues with working on empathy, um, basic science education, spiral curriculum. There's so many, and I guess that's the first task um, when, when we set this group up is to look and try and, you know, I guess it's anybody who knows that the CanMed flower for the Canadian medical education with all the different petals or the American um, College for Medicine have got the pillars. It's the question is what's on Manchester's pedagogic research flower or pillars? What do we want our USPs to be? What are we good at and what would be what's most marketable? Because we need to be competitive as well if we want to bring in some grant income and get PhD students working who can help with teaching as well, um, so it's not all about the research. We want to have innovative teaching 
I'm most envious because I hear SMS has lots of the anatomage tables that I've coveted for many years as an anatomist. So what, you know, are we researching in that area? There's so many possibilities. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so we got to move on to, um, to, to Andy, but there's just one more uh, point in the chat, which I think this one is for you, Tony, is just for you to, um, to have a think about. Uh, good to have a hint that a loads meeting may happen, but without a way of measuring current loads, uh, that meeting is going to be working largely in the dark. Um, yes. Yes, in part. What I'd say is that, I mean, everybody on this board meeting and across the school would want to see a more equitable distribution of teaching. And I think that that is a work in progress, which is gradually improved annually. So although we may not be getting to the point of um, perfection, we're certainly moving it forward. So what we need to do is to, is to level it up across all the divisions. And um, some of the divisions have been a little shy on the teaching that's begun to improve and that will allow us to reduce the load on the others. So I accept that it isn't anywhere near where we want it to be, but it is getting better. Thank you. And thank you very much, uh, Gabrielle, for that uh, presentation. So now we'll turn to Andy for a uh, research update. Andy. Trafford Director of Research for our school. Hi, Andy. Thanks, Ian. Um, hello, everybody. I'm trying to share my screen. Um, can you see this? Yep. Right. Uh, like Ian, I have a very flaky internet, so if I break up, I apologise. Um, I was going to try and give you a um, where we are sort of overview and then a little bit of a, a feel for the sort of activities that are ongoing. I think um, I'm not probably won't cover all these five areas, but I'll leave the slide set with Jenny so you can actually refer to it if you're um, interested in picking up any particular issues. So let's just start off with the structure, because that has changed um, with the appointment of Neil Hanley as the Vice Dean for Research and Innovation. We now have a more streamlined Faculty Research and Innovation Board, which used to be Faculty Research Group, which primarily consists of the Associate Deans for the various disciplines listed here, and also um, the PS side from Darian and Chris, although that post will be vacant imminently. We then at school level have got um, representatives at the School Research Committee from every division, along with internationalization with Holly and business engagement innovation with Rick and early career researchers with um, James Eels, although he's just been appointed to a lectureship. So we do have openings for postgraduate research representatives um, fellows and academic clinical lecturer representatives. So if anybody is interested in picking up those um, ECR type roles within the school research committee, uh, do please let me know. So that's um, who we are. Um, I thought then I'd be useful to give you an overview of our applications and awards data, particularly in light of what Tony mentioned um, regarding the concerns over particularly charitable funding. So this data is provided by um, the centre and you can see here the lines are the annual data for the previous four complete years and the bars are the current financial year. So in terms of applications in SMS, we're actually, I'd say, broadly on track with our historical average. Um, the big bump in terms of value there in 1819 was the Radnet submission. So I think if you took that out, we are maintaining our activity in terms of applications. Unfortunately, that appears to also be translating over to um, current awards. So again, broadly in line with our, I'd say, four-year historical average, again, if you remove Radnet from the equation. And I am aware that we've had quite a few awards from UKRI and BHF come through that aren't on here in March. So I'm actually hoping that we are going to be faring relatively well, despite the difficult circumstances. And then I thought it'd be useful to actually give an update on where this money is actually coming from. So I'm doing this at school level to start off with, and I've broken that down by the sectors um, that you can see on the um, pie bar there. Clearly, we are heavily charitable reliant in both our applications. And although I can't see this because it's under all your pictures, hopefully that one's showing you the data for award. So uh, I think it's just over half of our income is charitable based. If we look at the current year, 
um, we may get an idea for the impact of COVID on particularly that charitable sector. And again, I think it is evidence. Um, and there's a couple of things I wanted to highlight here is firstly that whilst our award value, or sorry, application value on the left here is broadly in line um, with our historical averages, we are submitting considerably fewer applications. So that indicates a smaller number, but bigger value awards, which is fine as long as we don't actually end up then with a low success rate and we'll have a big hit, which will presumably follow through next year. Equally with the um, awards data, we're a little bit down on the number of awards and a little bit down on the value. But I think if you took RadNet out, we'd be roughly where we are. But I think you can see from this, um, well, the intention was for you to be able to see from this, that actually our funding mix has changed quite dramatically this year and our charitable income has fallen um, relatively substantially um, up till February um, data that I have available. And then I thought I'd take that forward to uh, a divisional breakdown and only considering where we were in the previous four, four, four financial years. So again, the same um, scheme as before, that's in and terms of absolute values on the left by division, and that's broken down by um, the source of the income. So again, you can see we are again, highly charity dependent. And that then I think leads you on to, in most divisions that is, um, that then leads me on to um, some of the current funding challenges and towards the end, hopefully some of the mitigating steps that are ongoing to get us around this difficult period. So as Tony alluded, and as indeed is the case, heavy reliance on charitable income. Um, I do share Tony's optimism, however, in that I don't think it's gonna be as bad as we first feared. Um, if we can all stay COVID secure over the next 12 months or so, I think we'll have probably a bumper income from the shops, uh, which will translate ultimately to research funding availability. But the AMRC, so the Association of Medical Research Charities, predicted about a 40% shortfall in research funding um, in 20, 2021. Um, and indeed, for some of the major funders we have in SMS, particularly CI UK, that has led to active grants being cut and schemes being dropped altogether. So it's been quite hard in certain areas, but not so desperately bad in other areas. The AMRC did, however, think that um, this is sort of mid-2020, mid um, autumn 2020 sort of update, that it would take about four and a half years for that financial position for the charities to recover. Um, I guess we'll get an update on that in the next six or so months, and hopefully things aren't going to be as pessimistic as was first felt. The other area that's come about in the last couple of weeks that some of you may be aware of is that the overseas development um, budget has been cut by £120 million. So that has potentially a profound impact on our ability to get the Newton and GCRF funding. As it stands, however, we have minimal exposure in SMS, so we're not going to necessarily suffer acutely with active awards being stopped. But there is some concern, and I don't have any further updates on this um, presently, as to whether or not that shortfall may be met from other UKRI budgets. So there could be potentially a knock-on budget, knock-on effect for our response mode type funding. And the other major change that's occurred in the last sort of six to 12 months is the new or the revised welcome strategy. So as a headline, it's got three priority areas of mental health, global heating and infectious diseases. And you might think, well, that's not necessarily going to impact too adversely on SMS. I do think actually it presents some more opportunities um, rather than threats, and I'll come on to those subsequently. But there is a focus on early career researchers. So I think that is an area we could actually see, uh, could actually uh, mitigate against that fall in the charitable income sector from the welcome, obviously being a charity, but the BHF and CRU can particularly talking about. And the other thing I just wanted to bring to your attention, there's been several announcements on this, is the there is an underspend on the university's COVID allocation for UKRI applications. So you can still apply for um, costed extensions. The, the nominal date for the grants to close was the 30th of September 2021, but if you have a grant that ends after that time, you are still eligible to apply for that UK RI COA uh, funding. So I would encourage you to do that. Um, there is quite a lot unspent. So I think you probably ought to get your interest in now rather than waiting, um, assuming that it will still be there in six months time. Um, so 
Um, I don't necessarily intend to spend a lot of time on this. I thought it'd be good to give you an overview of where REF has actually ended up. So um, across the units of assessment, it's almost impossible to break this down by school because we're actually all spread across all the different units of assessment um, and some from SBS come into here as well. Uh, it looks as if we have a um, greater than 90% four-star and three-star publication um, expectation. It does come with an enormous health warning, however, Yes, the grade point average is increased compared to the actual results in REF 2014, but the scores are actually fairly similar to the data that was submitted in 2014. So whether this is actually going to translate to an uplift in our uh, REF performance or not is still debatable. And then I, I won't go through this in any detail. I've just put on for summary where the outputs are across the school. Um, some little bit of metrics that's come from Daniel James in terms of here, field weighted citation impact and um, outputs in the top centile. So the solid bars are the top 5% and the open bars are the top 25%. So I think that there's relative consistency across the um, school in terms of output um, metrics. Then in terms of ongoing activities, um, I'd like to just start and pause maybe by saying that this is a two way process. Um, we are interested in hearing your thoughts and actually suggestions for activities that we ought to be undertaking. It, it shouldn't just be what we think we want you to be doing or what we think you want us to do. It, it's very much you should be guiding us as to what you want us to do. Um, so you can approach me with those suggestions at any point or the research leads in your divisions. Um, there's been an update on the research and innovation survey yesterday, um, which you can read on the internet. Um, and another thing that um, is Neil and all of us actually are very keen on doing is, is a little bit more transparency on funding. So I do share this information with the research leads and divisional heads. Um, and I think you can get that from um, your divisional PI meetings in particular. We have changed the way in which um, the directors of research or ADs as we are now are working. Um, so we have more broader portfolio portfolios. So rather than being school specific, we're, we're working more with the funding agencies so John has picked up the BBSRC remit. I've picked up MRC. Karina has picked up the NIHR or, um, remit. And uh, I did mention to Neil that there was a big gap here given our funding dependence. And he's agreed that we do need to appoint somebody to look at the charitable sector in a little bit more detail. With a view to supporting income diversification and um, reliance or reducing reliance perhaps on one or two major funders. And from the MRC perspective, the current activities that we're pursuing are building a partnership calls. So these are open calls across all the boards. And we have quite a few that are potentially going in, um, both from SMS and SBS. So this is quite encouraging that uh, we are broadening our reach um, somewhat. Um, Mike White um, has taken on the Fellowship um, Academy role, and he's very keen on extending that from pre-award to also post-award, working with the fellows. Um, I'm actually next and a fortnight talking with people in FSC about the potential for actually working on the impact of climate and pollution on non-communicable diseases. So whether we can actually tie up the, um, if you like the global heating element of the welcome strategy with our basic bioscience and um, clinical research. And I'll feedback on that in due time, due course. Um, as a result of the BIA, as the RNI uh, survey rather, sorry, there is going to be a review of the biomedical services facility. And that's sort of been put, I have put that on hold um, because we, we do have a new director of the BSF who was initially trapped in France with the wrong visa, but she actually starts at Manchester today. So we're meeting her on Wednesday to start that um, process rolling. I think it's, it's right and proper that we do that with her part of that review rather than doing it before she turns up and imposing it upon her. As I said, we've got many opportunities for fellows to be involved, um, both at faculty and school level. And um, one of the things that we have done more recently is try to get a little, a lot closer aligned with the business engagement team. And hopefully you're seeing those sort of like tips and available funding opportunities coming through in the various school research newsletters. And the final thing is that I think we have to celebrate success a lot more and, and give the view that we are valuing research. So. There are some initiatives that I'm doing with Ian Speakman at school and faculty level to try and um, promote that. So I will stop there. I mean, it's a whistle stop tour. Um, and I thought I'd just give you a broad overview of where we're at. So Ian. Fantastic. Thank you very much, um, Andy. 
Um, so obviously we have a t uh, period now for questions to Andy. I've got one in the chat uh, line to open up. So on the UKRI extensions, Andy, is the deadline for when that money would have to be spent a tight one or is there a flexibility with that too? Uh, my understanding um, from this is that uh, it's a costed extension basis. So I, I, I'd infer from that that there's relative flexibility. So if you've been disrupted for six months and you ex you've got funds for maybe seven or eight months of, or you, you're applying for seven or eight months funds, that might be um, justifiable, particularly if you've got um, animal-based research as a good example, where it may take you three to four months to get your colonies back up to speed before you can actually do the research that you plan to do anyway. So I think I would take that as a flexible approach in the first instance. Okay. Are there any other questions for, um, for Andy? So, I mean, I mean, I'll, I'll ask just a, a, a kind of a, a, a naive question. I mean, I, I would have thought that, that you might've been a little bit more um, um, uh, perturbed about, about the welcome, the, you know, the, the three headline uh, sort of categories. Um, but it seems to me that what you're saying is that this is, this is an opportunity for us rather than something that we need to be worried about. I mean, can you just talk a little bit more about what the opportunities are as you see them? So I think that, yes, um, I think there are two or well, two or three points that in response in. Um, firstly, is that actually when I think the, the intelligence we've had back suggests that the vast majority of the money from Welcome will still be going down the regular route. So actually what we first thought is that you know, basic discovery science didn't look to have a place is not necessarily true, which is encouraging. Mm -hmm. um, from where you sit, um, I have asked Pratik to actually liaise with Welcome. He's supposed to be feeding back at School Research Committee um, tomorrow, actually, mm -hmm. on the impact for Chisholm type research. Mm -hmm. So I, um, you probably know ahead of me, what the outcome is there. Um, and I think there is an enormous amount of scope for particularly non-communicable disease um, research and the environmental pollution and global heating as, as welcome are calling it. Um, and I'm optimistic that we can actually make, um, make great strides in that area. Um, mm -hmm. And again, I can feed back to the school board um, after these meetings, which are due to take place middle of April onwards. But there's certainly enthusiasm from colleagues within FSE who are overtly in that space, space to work with us on yeah. um, that. I agree infectious diseases, mental health um, don't necessarily immediately spring to mind and could be seen as a threat. But I do feel that we can um, remodel ourselves externally right. to fit the opportunities which are there. Okay, yeah, I mean, I, I guess, the, I, I mean, one way of sort of furthering that question is like in your pie charts where the, where the purple, the, the kind of the charitable fund, how, how much of that is actually sort of welcome funding that will no longer be able to be um, kind of pursued within this new structure? I mean, are there gonna be winners and losers or um, is it just a question of sort of new, new um, potential partnerships? I think, well, I think it's, it's a potentially both. Um, the impact on the personal awards at senior level, I'm less clear on, but they do look to be potentially offset by the focus on early career researchers. Um, in terms of the amount of income from Wellcome versus CIUK and BHF, it's not that great. I mean, we do have quite a few senior investigators, which actually over the five year period contribute a lot, but relative to the other two charities, that's where our major exposure is. Um, right. So I've got a question here. Um, as there has been a big drop in charitable funding, yet overall funding is holding, where have we made gains over the last few years? Okay, so Simon, uh, it looks like the um, European EC, European Union, European Research Council, um, whatever acronym you want to use, has picked up the drop mainly this year. Um, and it is acute this year, uh, that change in funding income. I rather suspect that when we look at March's data, knowing the grants that have been awarded, but not included in the data I've presented, 
we'll see a, a, a more of a shift towards UKRI, which is, is good. And actually, I'd like to see that maintained and that dependence on charitable income reduced somewhat. Okay, thank you. Um, got a question from Andrew. Uh, hi, uh, very nice summary, uh, Andy. Um, uh, just a, a quick general comment. <laughs> the, um, the preservation of the um, EC Horizon system um, comes at quite a cost because this country used to generate a net income um, from that system. We, we put in less than we got back. And the, this government's known that um, for years. And that, um, the, to preserve that program, what they're now doing is taking the net balance, the, the, the difference between the amount we paid in and we lost, out of the UKRI budget. Um, so actually this constitutes a cut, quite a yeah. significant cut in overall funding. Um, so the squeeze is going to be on for UKRI, and it's also going to be on um, uh, for, for the welcome. And I think we should be thinking about that and preparing for it. The second point is um, I would caution against putting vast amounts of efforts into great big institutional bids in the hope that we can scoop 10 million pounds out the pot. Um, I'm cynical. This university has not had a good track record in attracting really big um, funding of that sort. The competition is ferocious. And I think we should be focusing on the quality individuals that we've got who currently hold these blue ribbon funds and doing everything we can to ensure that those groups um, continue to be successful. It's a very tough world that we're in and the bar's gonna go on rising. Uh, I find it very difficult to disagree with everything, anything you're saying, Andrew, not everything, anything. Um, however, I do feel that if we don't apply, we'll never get. So I think we have to try and participate in these large funding schemes. I expect, I accept that the, the hit rate is probably going to be very low, but it's better to be in there and trying than not trying at all. Because I think we'll get fur left further behind because I can see the potential for more of these collaborative network type funding calls to come through in the future at, at as you say, the expense of other funding schemes. Um, so, and yes, um, we do need to, help people at all stages with those personal awards those major awards um and we need to make sure they're not only successful in getting them the first time but they're also succeeding during the course of the award so they can actually renew them and move on to the next level particularly if you're talking at the early career researchers can i make one final comment um Please. which i'm sorry if it causes offense but i'll make it nonetheless um the um in the past i've been here a while now as you all know I've seen in the past bids put together, big bids, and internally in this university, perhaps to our disadvantage, these things can become internally political. And a number of people in the past have been associated with um, large bids who frankly should not have been on the ticket. They didn't have the credibility. Now the new research structures we have with Neil leading them, I think will enable the necessary level of brutality, and that's the word to use, to ensure that only people with outstanding um, CVs and outputs um, are going forwards. Because I know that we've damaged ourselves in the past, I've heard it from referees from other institutions, by having a kind of democratic Athenian democracy. Um, and that's not the world we're in. Uh, so I would plead with you to work with Neil to ensure that if we do go for big, big bids, we absolutely have to put our best foot forwards. Again, it's difficult to disagree. Um, and I think actually what, the ones I've seen are, I would say, filling that remit quite nicely. And they're not solely based in Manchester. They are bringing in multiple institutions. So I think that also helps with that um, concern somewhat as well, Andrew. Great, thank you. Um, so we have a sort of a follow-up question from uh, from Simon and then a, a sort of a longer question. So I'm gonna give you both of them and then you can respond unless you see fit. So the first one, how can we maintain UKRI funding into the future? Short, that's short and sweet. Uh, secondly, I'm a postgrad student and it's interesting to see the work on climate change. And I feel as much as, um, I, I feel that you should look into accommodating it into uh, research. You could also look at including or adding it into the curriculum. This will prepare those students 
that um, are preparing to venture into such careers while being medical students. For example, this could be feasible for students in microbiology since there has been a recent study on how climate change is linked to antimicrobial resistance. On this note, I'm working with other students from other universities in advocating for climate change in the medical curriculum. And I would be happy to discuss this further with the relevant person. So, so if I take the second question first, I think Carol's picked that up from a PGT perspective. Um, Gabrielle, if you're still here, I think, again, that probably is relevant um, from a teaching perspective. Um, certainly, Gertrude, happily to get in touch. Um, and I'd be very welcome, I'd very much welcome your um, thoughts on receiving your thoughts on that. Um, so can I leave that for you to, to just make contact with me and we can pursue that offline, if you like. And regarding Simon, um, <laughs> I don't know. I wish I had a crystal ball, Simon. <laughs> uh, I think it's quality quality research follows with quality papers, which follows with more quality research. So um, I don't think this is specific to you, Cara. I think that's a general uh, a general thing. Um, unless there's a specific issue you're asking me about, which I've not picked up in the subtlety of the question. It's going to be a challenge because I think with the, as at as we know from the ODA and potentially the ERC position, um, it's probably going to get tighter with UKRI. So um, I think the initial optimism over a, a real terms increase in the research budget was um, with Rishi Sunak's announcements originally has been offset by the dire financial position the country's in. So UKRI seems to be one of the targets um, that they've slashed, unfortunately. So it's going to be difficult. I agree. Can I, but, can I come in there? Yeah. Please. I, think, I think you know the point I'm going to make. Yeah. <laughs> but I might as well do it anyway. I mean, yeah. the point is, uh, we seem to continue in, a, in, we are in difficult financial times, but we seem to continue to uh, support areas which are geared towards charitable income, which I'm not against, of course, but we don't seem to be supporting areas which are uh, historically very good at being bringing an upcre funding so T tony is the person with well he'll say he hasn't got a budget but he's got more of a budget than i have which is zero and he, he but i think the case for appointments can be made and it's frequently made and um if it fits with um if you've got a good strategy to come forward to actually make use of those appointments they are being heard i, I would say fairly tony i'm gonna i'm wriggling out of this because i think this is very much a head of school sort of appointment level question well, I mean, he's, Simon's absolutely right. Um, we, he, he's, he's been here a while, same as I have, and there are repeated air at times when we're told that we should be more strategically focused both on teaching and research, and that investment in one should lead to disinvestment in another, but we're notoriously poor at, at disinvesting. But I think that the opportunity that's going to arise as a result of the falling in funding means that by attrition, we will change. There's no question. Those that are successful will remain successful and those that are not, I'm afraid, will, will be in bother. So uh, all of a sudden, there, there's a bit of um, robustness about, about the strategy and the way forward. So I think you're right, Simon, but I think it'll be done without, you know, pe pe there won't be any harsh decisions to make. The decisions will be made by the shrinking of funding. But, but as Gabrielle says, that just, we just remain being, being reactive, don't we? <laughs> well, um, I, I, I hope that, I mean, Andy and I have discussed this at, at length in the last few weeks. Uh, and I hope that we're going to move it forward in a bit more of a proactive way. I mean, we, we have opened up these discussions with world-class climate change people in FSE. There are large numbers of areas in, in, in this school which would lend themselves to um, taking up some of these welcome trust new initiatives. I don't think they'll necessarily be large bids, like uh, uh, Andrew said, but he's absolutely right. We haven't been strategic enough in, in the um, personnel that we've put on these things and we need to be more hard-nosed and that's precisely what we're going to be. 
But if I could just add, Simon, as well, I think um, there's another route to actually achieving your objective, and that is if you have some really stellar fellows, um, that they're going to be very difficult to disinvest in at the end if they've been successful. So that is the, the longer term, slightly more devious route to addressing that. And we have no intention of disinvesting in successful fellows. Yeah. Because when, when people decide to pack it in from this board, we'll need them to fill the ranks. Yeah. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, that was that went on um, sort of longer than scheduled, but I think that it was a very very useful uh, discussion. So thank you very much, Andy, for um, for that. Um, I I think that sort of Tony has kind of had some reflections, uh, you know, sort of um, articulated his thoughts on what it is it you said. So we should just get to the general open Q and A session um, and submitted questions. And so as I said, I have a a uh, submitted question to start us off. And please, again, use the chat line or raise your hand um, if you have any other questions for anybody else who's presented here um, uh, today. So the question, I think this is probably for David, um, is why are PIs Hello. being asked to conduct lab inspections to assess issues such as bins being full, eyewash saline bottles being in date, et cetera, rather than this being, a task carried out by technical operations managers or technical staff. For those of us without current technical research assistant support to delegate these tasks to, it represents yet another task to be carried out, which surely could be better managed or coordinated at local level. So um, Dave, do you wanna, is that, is that for you? Uh, I can try and give an answer. It might be satisfactory, I'm afraid. Um, I think at the moment the, the arrangements of health and safety are in a bit of a state of flux in terms of who is responsibility. Um, that's something that we're picking up through the technical review in terms of responsibilities for health and safety and who does what. Um, I think with the current situation through COVID and reopening of labs and returns of PIs and PI groups to the laboratories, it was deemed that um, in terms of compliance for that, um, PIs were asked to nominate or to actually take on that responsibility themselves in terms of groups returning to those laboratories and using them. Because not all technical staff, I think, are back or on site. Um, so I don't know whether this is around general health and safety or this is around the COVID um, compliance issues, or is it a more general issue around health and safety? You ask, do we know who asked the question? Um, I don't know who asked the question, but um, if okay. they're here and they want to follow so up, please okay. so raise, it, raise if it, your hand. It's a general if it's a general health and safety, yeah, we're aware of some of the problems. Um, and as I say, it's been picked up through the tech review, which will hopefully alleviate the problems. If it's to do with the COVID compliance, um, it's been deemed that uh, those compliance checks have to be picked up through the PI uh, or through a nominated person within that PI's group um, to do the, uh, the COVID compliance checks. Okay. Um, thank you, David. I don't believe there's any need for any follow-up on that. Um, I've run out of questions. Um, so we have, we have still another 15 minutes. If there are any questions, please raise them. Uh, I can just sort of say, okay, any other business? Is there any other business? I don't have any. Uh, except that we'll have to, um, we will um, be sending around uh, the agenda for the next meeting, which I guess will be sometime in June. Is that right, Jenny? The next meeting is on the 18th of May at 10 o'clock. 18th of May. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, that's very good. I really invite you all to, um, to use uh, the forms for submitting suggestions, um, questions, and the like, um, because you know, obviously, we had we you know we we had a couple of great uh, sort of presentations. I think they they um, they were very very informative, and um, you know you all know who you want to hear from probably more than I do. So it would be um, 
you know, if you, if you give us some names, uh, we'll pursue it and uh, we'll, we'll, we'll invite them um, promptly to, uh, to talk to you about what you're interested in. Gabrielle. Sorry, thank you. Um, I've just had an email through to say that graduation ceremonies for the summer are, are definitely postponed. This will be communicated to all students this afternoon at 4 p.m. Um, and could we please make sure we share this with wider PS and academic colleagues? Okay, thank you. Um, all right, then I guess there's all I need to do is to thank you all for a very uh, fruitful discussion. Um, hopefully you'll be able to get out of your offices now and go enjoy a little bit of um, recreation in the sunshine. And I look forward to hearing from you in the coming um, month or so, and uh, look forward to seeing you in uh, at the end of May. Thank you very much. Thank you.